What's going on, everybody? Welcome back to TOJ Talks. I'm your host, Will Parkinson, at WillPod11 on Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok. Another episode here on, today on the feed. It's a Thursday afternoon. The Jets just re-signed Ashton Davis, joined by uh, the legend himself, Rich Me. Rich, how are we doing today? Well, thanks for having me. Uh, always <laughs> good to talk Jets, especially with the draft uh, coming up. You know, yeah, we're... Uh... We're in a bit we're of a dead, yeah. We're in like that weird dead period. Um, it feels like the draft's like two weeks too late. It should be like, I feel like it should be two weeks earlier, probably this week. But I know the NFL wants their ratings and, uh, you know, and all that stuff. So I, I get why yeah. it is the way it is. But um, obviously, it's been a pretty, I would say, a pretty exciting off season. All things considered, the Jets have operated with somewhat within a budget. It feels like, um, but have done a lot of different things. Some big name players, actually, some moves. I think universally are like, oh, that was a pretty pretty shrewd business by the Jets. They've done a lot of uh, the last couple of years, almost getting guys, whether it's Tyreek Hill and AJ Brown and all these guys. And this year, like they actually landed a Tyron Smith. They actually convinced them um, and other people like that. What have you made of the off season, I guess, as a whole so far, the first, I guess, what, five, four or five weeks here of, uh, you know, a free agency in, in a trade market. Yeah. I mean, I think uh, you, you, just a few moments ago, you hit the nail on the head, you know, kind of a budget this year. And I think a lot of fans in the beginning maybe lost sight of that, you know, because, I mean, you just look at all you have to do is click on over the cap, you know, at the start of free agency. They did not have a ton of money to spend. And I think everyone was assuming, well, they'll just renegotiate a whole bunch of contracts and all of a sudden they'll have 50 or $60 million in cap room. But they did a lot of that last year, and this year they did not. They did it with C.J. Mosley, who essentially took a pay cut, but they didn't really do it this year that much. And the reason is because they want to preserve as much cap room in next year and the year after and the year after because they're going to have some really big contracts coming up with Sauce Gardner and Garrett Wilson and, and that crew. So they were hesitant to push money into, into later years, and I understand that. And so – I thought Joe Douglas, man, this is a classic win now offseason. You know, he behaved very much like a GM who is knows he's got to win this year, going out and getting a Tyron Smith, a Mike Williams, you know, a Tyrod Taylor as a backup, you know, who could come in and play if he has to. So I thought a lot of those moves were just like win now, one year. Every one of these guys they signed could be like one and done guys. Even like the guys who signed two-year contracts like John Simpson and Tyrod Taylor, it's, it's conceivably this whole free agent class could be gone in a year. Uh, but they know that, the Jets. I mean, th this is all about this year. We know what the pressure is for Sala and Douglas. And so I thought Joe Douglas address addressed all, pretty much all his needs uh, with all their Band-Aids. Their one-year Band-Aids. Some of them could be really good. I think Tyron Smith could be really good. Uh, some of them could turn out not so good. I think Mike Williams is a big risk because of the surgery. So we'll find out. Yeah, look, I, I think, you know, obviously, you know, as much as I talk about the, you know, the Jets five days a week and all that stuff and, and all that stuff, you, I still like to listen to, you know, other people uh, that maybe are kind of more national side of things. And some people have liked what the Jets have done a lot. I think some folks have been pretty critical of, you know, hey, win now mode. I guess I would phrase it as this, and honestly, you probably know better than anybody. You've been covering this team for a really long time. You've seen when it's worked and when it's not, and obviously it has not worked in a very long time. I felt like last year the team was so top-heavy that it was just so much like we have to rely on Aaron, where it might be still top-heavy this year, but I also feel like adding a Morgan Moses is a very much like, yes, I know he's 33 and it's a one-year deal, but like that makes sense to me. That was a – I didn't even think of Morgan Moses to be on the market because he's an affordable quality right tackle, which you just don't have a lot of, but the Jets had to be all in this year. I, I felt like not only are the staff on the hot seat, you've got an owner who, who knows what's going to happen in four or five months with where he's going to be his involvement in the team. You've got a quarterback who's kind of year to year. He says two, three or four years, but we really don't know, right? We just, we have no idea with Aaron as much as he says a lot of things. We don't, we, just, we simply don't know. And, and then you have guys on rookie deals that are going to get, as you mentioned, really expensive. They had to kind of go all in, and they have not made the playoffs since Barack Obama's second year in office. Okay, and like I, that's why it's just hard for me to be like, well, I don't. Some people were a little critical. I'm just not sure what what were they expected to do. Like, yes, they guess they could have restructured all their money and paid Robert Hunt twenty million dollars a year. Is that really how that's much is that? Insane. Yeah, right. That's what I'm saying. Like, there is just insanity. I mean, they're going to regret that deal in a year. Oh, 100%. Uh, 
Even like but, the, even like you mentioned Mike Williams, like oh, I guess what you would have traded for Keenan Allen, but his number's massive, and then you would have had to give him a draft capital, and he's even older than Mike Williams. I don't know. I just Mike Williams is the one movie that's risky, but at least it's a one year move, right? And it's like if it doesn't work, you hope you add in the draft anyways. Yeah, they they protected themselves with Williams and, and Tyron Smith with the the incentives, so it's not like they're giving out a, a you know a, a huge cap number. They did try to get Keenan Allen. I mean, but you're right that that cap number would have been would have totally restricted them from doing other things. They probably there's probably no Hassan Reddick on the team right now if if they have Keenan Allen. You know, yeah. it's just and that's why they didn't sign Bryce Huff because they knew they had these other needs to fill. Now I was a Bryce Huff guy. I thought they should have resigned him. I, I, th- I actually think they upgraded the position with Reddick. He is a better football player, like right now, than Huff is. And we all know this is all about right now. And you listed a whole bunch of really good reasons why it's right now, a win now. But the main reason is number eight. You know, yeah. Aaron Rodgers is forty years old, and like we don't know if he'll be around next year. He'll play another year. He says whatever, but. I mean, it's year to year with him. That is reason number one to go all in right now. So I have no problem with that philosophy. Yeah. You mentioned Reddick. Um, he's a guy that I I think he's a – trying to think if I can phrase this. If you don't watch every other team, and I'm not blaming people. A lot of people watch their team, and they watch the four, eight, and, and Monday night games. Like That's what people do, and that's totally fair. The Jets were on prime time a lot this year, and which was awesome. Reddick's an inc- really, really damn good football player. Like it'd be, it'd, I think you'd struggle to find – more than eight or nine guys at the edge position that are better than Reddick is right now and more productive. And I think that's probably a high number. Um, can you kind of give me, I guess, your opinion on how like a 2026 third round pick, like why not 2025? Bill Barnwell's talked about how he thinks it's because the Jets are going to trade up. I've mentioned the Jets trading up and I want to get to that at some point, but it feels like there's no way he plays 67 and a half percent of the snaps because the Jets played nobody that much. No, so it kind yeah. of just feels like it's a 2026 20, third for a one-year deal for a guy who should get you 12 to 14 sacks. Yeah, I agree. Uh, he's he's a really good player. Uh, I'm curious to see how the Jets use him. The Jets are strictly a 4-3 team. You know, you saw the Eagles use him. I mean, he's like he's listed as linebacker with the Eagles. They're like a 3-4. I watched a lot of tape on him. He's a stand-up guy, you know, um, but – you know, he could be a stand-up end for the Jets in a 4-3. Uh, Jermaine Johnson basically was that last year. He played out of this three-point, out of the two-point stance a lot last year. And, you know, he did well. And Reddick is is one of the best pass rushers in the league over the last four years. It's documented. Now, he did have a slip last year in, if you look very closely at his pass rushing metrics, like pressure and sack percentage, they took a pretty big dive last season. I mean, he still had 11 sacks, which is very good. Uh, But I don't know if that's scheme related. Obviously, the Eagles had a lot of issues last year, changing coordinators in the middle of the year. So I'm not sure if that was a factor. But look, that's an upgrade, in my opinion. I don't think he'll hit that playing time threshold. So it'll be a three in a couple of years down the road. So I thought that was a good trade for the Jets. And uh yeah, I mean, they have – I wrote this the other day. They have eight former first-round picks on defense, which is the most in the league. And if you count Reddick as a defensive lineman, they have six on the defensive line, which is really unusual. Now, Sala had that in San Francisco in 2020. He had six defensive linemen, former first-round picks. You just don't see it that often in the NFL. Yeah, it's in a league that is uh... – you know, is it offense, offense, offense? The Jets, of course, have uh, a million plays, people on defense. Really funny, tit, funny tidbit, obviously, while we're, we're recording here. The Mets are – the Mets. Are, I'm not a Mets fan, but they're playing the Braves, and Luis Guillorme is pitching for the Braves right now because the Mets are blowing them out. He's given up five runs in the last third of an inning. Oh, I had to check him on that. Yeah. I, 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 I delay earlier, but uh, – I just I'll... saw Luis Guillorme pitching, and I was like – you mean the, the Mets infielder? I was like, oh, I didn't even realize he was on the Braves, let alone uh, yeah. pitching for the Braves. But um, obviously, Ashton Davis resigned, you know, an hour or two ago. Um, I, I like Ashton Davis. I feel like I've been much higher on him than most people, especially early on. I felt like it took him a while at Cal. He's such a naturally gifted athlete. And I felt like he always found himself around the football. Um, even like two years ago when I don't think he was very good. Um, he picked off two a few times. It felt like he was just – he's always around the ball. And then he had the Cleveland game. Again, he played one defensive snap, found himself with an interception. I don't know what it is. There's certain guys that just find the football. I don't know how to explain it. Um, 
if Sauce Gardner had uh, Ashton Davis's interception numbers, we probably would be uh, – people would stop hating on him maybe so much. But I, I guess what do you ma- – yeah, literally. <laughs> what do you make of Ashton, uh, you know, coming back? It felt like um, – I think you mentioned this and a couple of folks have mentioned this. You know, he wanted to go start somewhere. I guess he has the opportunity to do so here with Whitehead leaving. But Chuck Clark, they seem to value. What do you make of the safety position as a whole? Yeah, I mean, I still think they need someone there. I mean, it's uh, I, I like the move bringing back Ashton Davis. He's he's a good chess piece. You can move him around when they play three safeties, which they do a lot. Um, he's like the third safety. He can come down in the box. He can play deep. Uh, they use him that way. He's a key guy on special teams. I think maybe his role will be even more uh, with the new kickoff rule. I think you you know um, you know you want guys. I, He's just a good special teams player. And after losing Hardy, I think uh, Brent Boyer is probably really doing cartwheels to get Ashton back. So I, the market spoke. I mean, no one considered him a starting safety. Otherwise, he would have taken that job. He's a really good athlete, like you mentioned. He was an All-American hurdler at Cal. I think maybe he's not as instinctive at the position. Um, you know, maybe he just needs to be placed in certain situations. Uh, so. Could he push Chuck Clark for a starting job? Yeah, I would expect him to push him. I, I expect the competition there along with uh, Tony Adams. But, uh, you know, it's a good – I know Sala at the owners' meetings in Orlando, I mean, Sala was really, you know, praying, pretty much praying for Ashton Davis to return. So I know Sala's happy about this, and it's a good move. I'm sure it's a one-year contract probably for something – under two million. Yeah, I was going to say it's probably one for one and a half, two million. You yeah. tweeted at the list uh, a few moments ago of kind of the remaining people. Um, I, you know, Hardy was the guy that I felt like he actually got less than I. I know the rules, the new rules kind of probably screwed him a little bit, but based on what some of these other special teams guys that have had similar type of careers as him got significantly more money. And I was just, it was interesting. I think he signed too late. I wonder if the rule change happened. If he signed before the rule change, if anything would have maybe changed in terms of what he got, I think at one for like one point five, right, or something. Yeah, I think it was one for one four, or maybe yeah. one five, and uh, you know maybe half of that or three quarters of that guaranteed. I thought he would get a little bit more. I mean, he did break through last year. He had uh, two years ago the Pro Bowl year. You know, then he was injured this year. He had that torn hamstring, which had sur- required surgery. You know, I like Justin. I thought the Jets should have brought him back, uh, but you know they have uh, Irv Charles. Who came in, you know, last year, undrafted guy, you know, after a year on the practice squad and comes in and he did a really good job as a gunner. I think in his first game on his first punt, he caused a fumble against Denver, which was a big play early in that game. So uh, so I think they saw him as their new Justin Hardy, a younger, cheaper Justin Hardy. Yeah, no, I, it makes it makes a ton of sense. Would you expect really anything the rest of? I think it's probably going to be quiet now. I would assume until until the draft. Then we get into that like June period where, if a Bakhtiar is an option, that's when that type of stuff will happen. There's no way he's reporting for voluntary workouts at this point in his career. Um, you know, maybe it's a, a veteran running back. You mentioned safety is in their spot. Do you really expect anything else to happen? I guess Connor McGovern's the the name out there. Obviously, ended up getting hurt last year. Um, there doesn't really that denied it. There's no chance he's coming back. I don't know why people keep asking about this. That, no, I that, think that's going to happen. That's been, that's been done since uh, probably two years ago. Um, what, what else? Do you see anything else happen? I guess McGovern is really the only one, right? And then maybe some of the veteran, you know, one-year guys in, in June. They will sign a veteran running back. Uh, you can count on that. Um, I'm just not sure when it'll be. I don't think they'll draft one. You know, they have Izzy in the pipeline. Um you know, they're going to have to address, uh, they're going to have to get another safety, whether it's a veteran guy or whether they draft one. My hunch is they probably draft one in the third or fourth round, something like that. Um, McGovern, I think, is a real possibility coming back. I think that would be a really good move to bring him back. I mean, Tipman, I mean, let's, I mean, Tipman did okay last year, but I mean, let's not call him Mike Webster just yet. You know, he's, uh, he's got a ways to go and he's kind of the young pup on that offensive line he's surrounded by a, a really veteran group right now so and he really is only are as good as your center so they got to get Tipman really playing at a high level this year but I think McGovern would be a really good guy to bring it back as a backup obviously the rest of the league does not see him as a starter otherwise he'd be signed somewhere uh, and then yeah a tackle they're going to have to do something that could be post-draft 
uh, with Bakhtiari, it wouldn't be surprised if it was like August or something like that. <laughs> yeah, right? re- report July 20, 26, then he's he's in camp July, you know, July 30th. Yeah, uh, they may not yeah. even, if they draft a tackle at 10, I don't think they'll go out and get a uh, veteran then. I mean, because, I mean, how many tackles are you going to have? Are they going to have Carter Warren on the team? I think Max Mitchell is probably roster spot is in jeopardy this year. So uh, especially if they draft someone. So if they draft someone at 10, then I don't think they'll go out and get a veteran. Do you buy the Carter Warren hype? You know, I thought he did okay last year. Now I, I, I'm looking at all the statistics. I, I should probably go back and just like watch more tape, but uh, no. Like hype from who? Like hype from the fans or hype from the? I know, just feel like we see we've heard so much. Oh, Carter Warren! Like we love Carter hype Warren. Players so much that you just have to take it with a grain of salt. If the Jets thought Carter Warren could be their opening day starter, they wouldn't have gone out and got Morgan Moses. You know, yes. so now could Carter Warren be their starter next year in twenty five? Yeah, he could be then, but they didn't want to take it you know, take the chance on starting them this year. And I think that's, they're in win now mode. And it's kind of a shame because, I mean, those are the kind of draft picks you have to play. I mean, he was a fourth round pick. You expect a fourth rounder to have a pretty good chance of being a starter for you someday. He got a lot of playing time last year. I think he played 300 snaps or so. And so those are where the draft, where Joe Douglas has failed is that those middle round picks where are those guys playing? No, they did hit Michael Carter. You know, great pick, fifth round, right? With Michael Carter, fifth yeah, round, Michael they Carter. They went back to back. They went back to back. Yeah, yeah. The, the Michael Carter draft back to back. So one of them worked out really well. That's probably Joe Douglas's best draft pick after the first round was Michael Carter. But they need more of those guys. Carter Warren should be starting this year, but he's not because. They're impatient and they got to win now. So they go out and get a Morgan Moses. Yeah. Look, I, I thought last year he was pro ready coming out in terms of like, he was much further along. I thought in terms of where Max Mitchell was coming out of the draft. And I, I thought the not get hurt at the end of last year. If I'm making that, I don't but know. He if did I'm, miss a lot of, I get, you know, yeah. he did miss a lot of I just, just That was disappointing. You wanted to see like, is this guy legit good? Or are we, is it like, he was good in college and got hurt. And yeah. that was a thing in college too, right? Like he's, and that's why he was a fourth round pick. He got hurt. Um, that's part of what happens with some of these guys. Yeah. He missed yeah. he missed OTAs. Then he came to training camp. I remember he came in for Beckton in the hall of fame game and he did a couple of good things. And I thought, hmm, that's interesting. But then he got hurt again. He missed the whole summer and he was way behind. And so I, I get that part of it. Uh, but he did end up playing a lot last year. Yeah. I just, that's where you mentioned it. I'm like, one of the Jets going to hit a fourth round or fifth round guard or fifth round center that look, I mean, you look back, we always, we, everyone always fantasizes about the 2008, nine and 10 offensive lines. And um, even you go back to 98 through 05 uh, or so, there was obviously a brief gap where the offensive line was not good. That's why the Jets were not good in that couple of mid- middle years, but it wasn't just five first round picks. It was mix of, free agents Brandon Moore is a converted defensive tackle that they end up ends up being a really good player like um you know when you look at a Damian Woody obviously and those guys and Fanica were more the veterans but and they drafted first round guys no doubt but you know you went like looking at Jason Fabini and all these different guys and going oh my god they just have a million first round picks like a good offensive line you have to look at the Chiefs these are Trey Smith's a six rounder Creed Humphrey's late second round um obviously they signed Thune and they, they've they've plug and played tackle so my point is as as you agree, like as you mentioned, hitting on a receiver, hitting on a guard, hitting on these guys in rounds four, five, and six, a running back makes us you don't have to go pay these guys and spend premium capital. And I want to talk about the draft quickly before we wrap here. You mentioned you're gonna have you know some stuff coming out with Bowers versus offensive line, you know, pass catch. Obviously, I, I'm in the I'm full in the camp of. And again, I don't know how realistic this is. Sometimes you hear stuff and you go, oh, it makes, that's exciting. And other times you're like. I think the Jets would love to trade back. I, I understand that. But I also think this is a draft where you could get really aggressive and say picks four, five, seven, and eight are all probably for sale. And if we really want to go get one of these superstar receivers, like we can go do it if we want to. Um, are you more in that camp? Or are you kind of like stay put at 10? Are you a trade back? Like, I think everyone has a different opinion on this, uh, no matter who you talk to. Yeah. Uh, well, Joe Douglas has never traded back in the first round. So he's he's only traded up. Um, I came away from the owners' meetings in Orlando thinking definitely that the Jets wanted to trade down. 
that was uh, the impression I got from talking to some people out there. And but now I, I think really anything is on the table. Yeah, I could absolutely like Atlanta at number eight. To me, that's a prime spot. Uh, if you want to jump Chicago and go into number eight, you'd probably only have to you'd have to give up maybe both fourth round picks, but you'd be, be able to keep based on the the Jimmy Johnson chart, you give up two fourths to go up two spots and you get Roma Dunze. And I think that would be a great move for the Jet offense to get that extra playmaker in there. Because Atlanta, they're going to pick a defensive player and they can get the same guy. <laughs> they don't give a shit whether they pick an 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. Yeah, like, it doesn't matter. In offense, Atlanta's going to take defense. They could move down a couple of spots, pick up a couple extra picks. I think that's a perfect spot for the Jets to go is number eight, assuming one of those receivers is still there. So I could definitely see that happening. You know, yeah, could, yeah. They, could they move up to to try to get Joe Alt? I, I mean, then you're probably going to have to get ahead of Tennessee. So you may, do you make a trade with the Giants? I mean, that's a pretty – to go from 10 to 6, you're going to have to give up probably next year's two and maybe this year's three. So then you're pretty much cleaning yourself out for Joe Alt, who's a, a terrific prospect. But that might be a little too rich for the Jets' blood. But if, I would watch that number eight spot with Atlanta. And, of course, so I think Joe Douglas, I think this is going to be an on-the-clock decision. You know, if if what they, if they're sitting at at eight and they think they can get up a couple of spots to get a Dunze, I think they might do it. Or if, yeah. if that doesn't work out and they're sitting at 10 and they can move back two or three spots and get an extra pick and – still get a really good offensive lineman. I think they could do that too. I think they're, from what I'm gathering, the fact that they only have two picks in the top 100, I think that's a source of concern for the Jets. I think they really like to get that a number, a third pick in the top 100. Yeah. No, I, look, it makes sense. I think the Jets need to be, you can, I feel like after, as soon as, we expect probably the first four picks to be quarterbacks, or at least the first three, potentially the first four or five. Um, right. I've heard Arizona that really like, wants to get out of that pick because they know they can move back and still get the exact same player at six, for example, with the Giants, and they pick up an extra one or two, whatever it is. Like they're in a regime where like they're in year two, they can kind of there's no there's no pressure. Plus, it's the Cardinals. Um, I think the Chargers. Every impression I get from the Chargers is they need to accumulate picks. That roster is. Pretty bad outside of Justin Herbert now. They've gotten rid of a lot of veterans. They're going to eventually dump Bosa and Mack, I'm sure, at the deadline. Um, they're kind of – it's like Slater and obviously Herbert and a couple of other guys, and you're like, eh, I don't know. This isn't such a great roster anymore. Um, and we know Harbaugh loves to accumulate assets. It's like, I don't know if the Jets will go up that far. Do I think if Marvin Harrison or one of these guys slips to five or six or seven, you start to have a really different conversation? Yeah, I do. Um, but I, I agree with you. Like – I've made this argument a couple of times and I think we had talked so much about how, and I think you would agree with this. I would assume the jets for so long, when they've brought in these rookie quarterbacks with just like utter shit around them for lack of a better term. And like, if Rogers only played a year and look, and you know, the jets went pass catcher. Well, next year, if another quarterback comes in, they're playing with Garrett Wilson, Brees Hall and Roma Dunze all under the age of 25. Like you're in a pretty good spot as a rookie quarterback and, um, or a younger, even a veteran stopgap guy, like you're at least in a decent situation. I just think they're body short at, as a as pass catcher, whether it's Bowers or Dunze, Brian Thomas, whatever it may be, or it's one of those top two guys. Um, you mentioned Bowers. I, I, I have not, other than Zach Wilson, I feel like we have not seen this much like or dislike for a player. I don't know what it is with, with yeah. Bowers. I don't know if he's just, he's a tight end. People are still start, is it Kyle Brady still like haunting people? Like yeah. what's going well, on with that? The older Jet fans are scarred by Brady and Mitchell. Uh, the younger Jet fans, I think, see the position tight end, and they're, and they're freaked out by that. So uh, my position on it is I'm in the offensive tackle camp. I would take an offensive tackle over the tight end there. And as you mentioned, I have a story coming out on Saturday where I take like a deep dive into this, uh, the pros and cons of Brock Bowers, and he's a good player. He's going to be he, – he'll be a fun player – to watch. I'm just not taking a tight end at 10 because I mean, there's just the value for the position. I mean, everyone wants, you're telling me he's going to be Travis Kelsey, then sure. I'm going to take him. But Travis Kelsey is a unicorn. I mean, that's, it's a once in a generation type tight end. Um, I think the jets first and foremost 
have to fortify their offensive line to protect Aaron Rodgers. And everyone assumes that the guy they draft at 10, if it's a tackle, will be the backup. He'll be the sixth man and jump in if someone gets hurt. Well, who's to say that if the tackle you draft, if whether it's Fawaga or Fashanu, what if that guy beats out more can beat out Morgan Moses at right tackle? There, there's no law that says Morgan Moses has to be a starter. I mean, he's only making five and a half million. He could be a swing tackle for you. In fact, when the Jets had him a few years ago, he started out as a swing tackle. And it only lasted about a quarter and a half because uh, Becton got hurt in that Carolina game and they had to put Moses in. He ended up being their best lineman that year. But let's say Fawaga comes in and he is he's a quick study and he really gets it. They could start him at right tackle. There's no there's no law there that says you have to go with two 33 year olds. Uh, I would think Tyron Smith is probably pretty set at left tackle, given his his body of work, assuming he's healthy. So I'm in the tackle camp. I just think it's the best move for the Jets for now, for the future. And I think Joe, du- I think ultimately that would probably be what he does. I'd be a little bit surprised if they go with Brock Bowers. To me, could you imagine the fallout if Tyron Smith gets hurt again and they have to go through a year playing uh, Carter Warren at left tackle or something? It, it would be a repeat of last year. It would be the definition of insanity. And I think for a GM whose job is on the line, I think he'd have a tough time telling his owner uh, or coming up with an excuse and why they did that again. So um, Bowers, I would trade that if I could trade down and get him, that would be great. I just don't want to take a tight end who's a little undersized. And by the way, if you, if you look at the analytics very closely, he's, he's got an unusually high number of passes that he catches before, like before the line of scrimmage, you know, they throw a lot of screen passes to him at Georgia and said, just run Brock run. And he's so great a runner in college that he was getting nine yards per catch, yards (laughs) after the catch. Is he going to be able to do that against NFL defenders? I don't know. So for me, I'm going, I'm going offensive tackle with that position. Yeah, I'm going, I've been pretty steadfast. And one of the first three receivers is my number one priority. Cause I think I would take a receiver. If one of the three guys, if any of them slip or if they're at 10, I think it's a no brainer. I, I, I've, the neighbors thing. I, I saw people complaining. Could, could he last in a big city? I don't know, man. I'd, I'd figure it out um, with that type of talent. Then I, I think, can you draft somebody? I know Connor Rogers has loved um, Troy Fatano out of Washington with his versatility to potentially play all five spots. Like who, and you mentioned Morgan Moses. If you drafted a guy like that, who's to say he doesn't beat out John Simpson, who's really one year away, like decent signing for low value, but was a guy a year ago who could have been out of league in a year and he had a really nice year as on the Ravens, but like, it's not as if like, if you're not drafting a guy because of John Simpson, I, as much as I think he could be potentially fun in the run game, um, that would probably, probably not ideal. I just think it's receiver and tackle in terms of like 10 and 73 or vice versa. I think it's the first few picks. I feel like will be a pass catcher in an offensive line. may have to be. Yeah, you know, Simpson's only making six million guaranteed. So again, you know, you're not crippling your yourself if you put him on the bench. So if they draft a Troy Fautano, who some people compare to Elijah Vera Tucker just because of his his size and and his length and the whole thing, uh, you know, heck, he could be the Fautano could be the starting left guard on opening yeah. day. You know, yeah. with AV, the AVT at right guard. So uh, so yeah, I mean. That's a good point. Simpson is not etched in stone either. As a, yeah, there's as, like as a, it's like two and a half guys are etched in stone. Tyron Smith etched in stone by name and play, but not by injury. It's really AVT. They, the problem is their three best linemen on paper are awesome, and the problem is is all three of those guys deal with have dealt with injuries. Even Tipman last year, and in college, you'd both shoulders right. AVT was not injury yeah. prone and has become it. Um, I want to ask you quick, like two more quick questions about the draft. A lot of people talk about Michael Pratt, Jordan Travis is two potential names on day three. You know, Spencer Rattler's name gets floated around there. Um, the only one of those guys I would take is, is Michael Pratt because the Jets have done way too much, as you know, of the high ceiling, risky quarterback, whether it's a developmental guy, whether it's a first round pick. It's always like, ooh, look at the traits. Like, this guy could be this. Pratt is who he is. Um, it's a four-year starter. He's played in big-time games. His whole thing is leadership and accuracy and these stuff. The Jets could use a stable backup that's a cheap option for three or four years that could spot start. 
Jordan Travis is a guy who, at least for me, uh, the arm is not NFL caliber, and he's coming off a knee injury and or a leg injury in which, like, I don't know if he'll ever play again. Like, I know he'll he might play, but right. I don't know like how effective. And then Rattler, I don't know. I, he's an undersized, big arm quarterback. I, I think I'm I think I'm good on watching those uh, for a yeah. while. Do you have any read on? I know they've mentioned adding a third quarterback. Obviously, I don't want to talk about Zach. We've talked about it a million times. He's not going to be on the roster. Um, what? What do you make of that, well, like, Woody potential? Johnson said was going to be on the roster. I know, yeah. You should definitely take Woody at his word. He's definitely not a politician yeah, either. No, that was just some posturing, the good old-fashioned <laughs> posturing there. But, um, yeah, I mean, I, I think Rattler is probably a third-round pick. I don't – I'd be a little surprised if the Jets took a quarterback in the third round. I think I more – one of those four, fours, right? Yeah, more four and later. Uh, they've done a lot of work on Pratt. Uh, obviously, they had him in. They had uh, – the other guy in uh, from Florida State, and I agree, Pratt, you know, I know in the fall they did a lot of work on Pratt as well, and I think he's more of a touch and timing passer, probably won't blow anyone away with his arm strength, but like you said, a lot of starts, um, accurate, and yeah, I mean, look, it probably makes sense to draft someone, they got to get someone in the pipeline, they only have two quarterbacks, they need probably four for training camp because maybe Rodgers is not going to get a ton of reps in training camp as he comes back. There's no bubble wrap, (laughs) bubble wrap them. Or even for OTAs, I, you know, you probably want to bubble wrap them a little bit. And Tyrod Taylor, you know, he's older. He's had some also bubble wrap. (laughs) Might want to, yeah, bubble wrap him a little bit. So whoever their third and fourth quarterback is maybe in the springtime is a great opportunity to get them some reps. And so I think Michael Pratt is a guy that you could definitely, I could definitely see in the fourth or fifth round. Joe Douglas, obviously 0 for 2 now picking quarterbacks. You know, Wilson, obviously a big miss. And then James Morgan in the fourth round, I want to say, right? Fourth round, James Morgan, who never who never did anything. I mean, he just, I think maybe he had a moment in one of those preseason games at MetLife. You know, he had yeah. a, a... Did he have the Hail Mary? I think it was the Hail Mary, yeah. yeah. That was the James Morgan, his... His two minutes of fame, but uh, that was a pick that I didn't understand from the beginning, and it, it just didn't work out. So, uh, but yes, absolutely, I could see a pick on day three for sure. Last question here: We mentioned trading back a little bit, and was there any way the Jets could go on draft night that would surprise you? I think, I think they need to add a defensive tackle. Still, um, I don't feel like that convinced with the defensive tackle room, even though they pushed Javon Kinlaw's money into twenty twenty nine and. Um, I know there's talent there and I know they like Solomon Thomas, although I think the numbers last year were a little inflated based on the actual tape. Um, I was, I wanted to ask you if David, anything would surprise there. And I just want to hit on JFM before we wrap here. Yeah. I mean, they have basically one star and all backups at defensive tackle. You know, they got Quinn and Williams and then all the guys like Lecky Fotu, um, Ken Law is a backup who might be a starter. Solomon Thomas is a backup, uh, just a lot of backups that they'll probably rotate through there. And so, yes, they do need a defensive tackle. Um, are they going to draft one in the first round? If they do, then there's going to be, I think the fans will like rush one Jets drive. and, and, and <laughs> The Jets show select up with, Byron Murphy. <laughs> show up with pitchforks and torches and, and, you know, so I don't see that happening. I mean, look, yeah, they need a defensive tackle. A lot of teams need defensive tackles. The Jets have one of the best defensive tackles in the league, so uh, they need to chill out on that a little bit and fix the offense. And so could they do it in the third round or fourth round? Yeah, I guess I could see it there, but would not expect a defensive player with the first. Yeah, first look, round. if Devondre Sweat somehow was still on the board in the fourth round, and I know there's concerns, but you're like, hey, we're going to get him in here and like we're just going to try. Like Chris Jenkins isn't going to fall that low, um, even though I think – He's much more of a run stopper, I guess, which is more what they need. Um, I, I wanted to guess, kind of ask you lastly here, there's two guys, one or three guys, really. JFM, who obviously, you know, there was some of that stuff out. I, I just don't see the benefit. Like, they kind of need him still. Like, by if you got rid of JFM, then, like, you kind of cancel out the adding of Redick. I know Redick's a better player, but it just doesn't really make a whole lot of sense. And you don't really save much money unless you post June one him. And then how are you replacing him? Um, and then Tyler Conklin and Michael Carter both feel like kind of no brainers to extend at certain level, different varying numbers, obviously in years, but I, is there a reason uh, 
like to not extend them. I, I know I know as we mentioned that the budget and all that stuff, but those guys, whether it's this regime or another one, would be useful players. And I guess especially if they don't draft Bowers, you really do need Conklin for not just this year but going forward. Yeah, I think Michael Carter is definitely someone they would like to extend. Um, you know, you saw um the was it the Moore from uh Indianapolis got extended. Yeah, Moore you know? and then um then Johnson up in Buffalo, I think as well. Yeah, yeah, he's a good player. And uh I think they came in at what is it, like nine or ten million a year or something yeah, like that? Yeah, I think Kenny Moore got three for thirty and I think Johnson got three for like eight and a half a year. So somewhere yeah. like eight and a half to ten million. Whatever financial ballpark you're looking, I think the Jets would like to do that with Michael Carter. I mean, he's been a really good player. Uh, I'd much Conklin, rather extend I'd much rather extend Carter than Reed, by the way. Third contract, smaller corners, uh, it does not usually go well. Yeah, you know, I was hearing some smoke around that earlier. You know, he changed the agents, uh, Reed, and, uh, you know, I, I was hearing some smoke earlier in free agency that they might be talking about a, about a deal, and it never really came to fruition. Um, yeah, Carter is someone you'd like to keep. And then uh, Conklin, again, it would be a third contract for him, and he's a good tight end, you know, not dynamic. Didn't score a touchdown last year. More of a more of a possession guy. Um, you know that would that would I'm I'm not so sure they're going to extend him. That might yeah, be a little. It might be a wait and see what happens this year and how. To me, yeah. he's like a two. Like you kind of extend him on basically what he's on now, and like you would add a year or two. Um, I feel the same way with Reddick and all these guys. Like if you wanted to, ex- I know there was some. Schefter mentioned one report, then Rappaport mentioned something else, and. But, like, if you were to do something with Reddick, it's like maybe you tack on a year and try to, like, I just don't know that you want to pay these guys two, three, four years down the line. Um, I agree with you on Carter. Reed, I just, I don't know. Even with Reed, it's like maybe you tack on a year. I just get nervous with, like, third contract, smaller corner. You're going to have to pay Sauce and Carter. You can't pay all three. You kind of have to choose at some point. Um, yeah, you were yeah. obviously going to choose the two younger guys. <laughs> yeah. You would hope. That that would be the smart business. <laughs> but, yeah, um, and JFM is, uh, I know... When when the Reddick trade happened, I know that I think I think he's probably a little concerned JFM that he was going to get cut. Um, I think what could happen with him is, I mean, it's a sixteen million dollar cap charge and it's thirteen million base, and I think only three million of that is guaranteed. What I could see the Jets doing, and I know their their mo on this because they've done it before, is they'll wait till June, like they did with <laughs> Carl Lawson and Jordan Whitehead. And Jamison Crowder, and they'll in June they'll say they'll go to him and say, "Look, we want to cut you by fifty percent." And you know, and that's it's that's the crappy part of the business because JFM's a good player. He would get scooped up in a second. He's only twenty seven years old. All right, doesn't get the splashy sack numbers, but he's a good run defender and he plays hurt and he's out there every week. Yeah, he and was I, really hurt last year. I, I, I talking to JFM. Early in the offseason, I was like, you had what? Like, how, your entire body was shot. I don't know how he was playing at half the time. He's, yeah, he has like a, a hip, hip thing. Yeah, he is a warrior, and he's good in the locker room. He's one of their longest tenured players now. But one, of the, one of my favorite interviews on the roster, I have to say. Yeah, he is. I, I like J- – I always got along with JFM. I actually sat next to him at a banquet about a year – was it a year ago or a year and a half ago on Long Island? Uh, it was the Marty Lyons Foundation banquet, and it was – He's it just was himself. It was near my house, so of course I'm going to go. I didn't have to schlep to Jersey. And so we sat next to JFM and his wife and uh, with my wife, and we just really had a, had a fun time that night. And yeah, I, he's, I won't he's himself, JFM. unapologetically. Like, you're, you're getting what you get uh, with JFM. Yeah, yeah he, he'll speak his mind, and uh, it's a great story, you know, how he got cut and, you know, got a big contract, and he certainly played up to it. But this being a very cold-hearted business, I could certainly see the Jets – trying to cut his contract in, uh, you know, June or July when all the spots around the league are filled and the player has very little leverage. That would suck for him, but uh, you know, we know how this business goes. Yeah. Last one, sorry. Just you, I was going to end it here and you just made me think of one. No, of that's right. You I, talked I, about, we've talked about Corey Davis a lot and, uh, and it feels like to me, if Corey wanted to be a Jet still and like the Jets, all this stuff meshed, like he just would have come back. Um, I, I don't know what will happen there. It feels like inevitably one of Corey Davis, MVS or Lazard are on the roster and like playing meaningful games at some point. 
MVS is going on a press tour talking about Rodgers' favorite teammate ever and, yeah. and all that. Corey Davis, obviously, the Jets have talked glowingly about him. But again, as I mentioned, it feels like he got reinstated and they could have just kept him. And like, he, I, I feel like he's gone. Um, am I reading that real? And Lazard, I feel like they're just pretending he's not on the roster and he's just going to be a dead $12 million cap hit just sitting yeah. there. You're not reading Corey wrong. Uh, I think from what I was told, and this was right around the time when he was reinstated, I think he wants to play somewhere closer to home, which is Nashville. So whether that's Tennessee or maybe Cincinnati or Carolina, uh, the word I got was that uh, the Jets would take him back to try to win a roster spot, but they think he wants to play closer to home. I frankly don't know what all the fuss is about. I mean, he wasn't even a good player for the Jets. I mean, he's a good guy. He plays hurt. He wasn't even a good player for the Jets. They overpaid the fan, for the him. The fans hated him for two, three years, and then he and then he was going to come back. And it was, it's like yeah. absence makes the heart grow fonder. I guess it's one of those situations. Uh, he was not good. And if he came back, like, what would he be? Like, uh, I think Lazard is probably better than Corey Davis. And Corey's not going to be a fifth receiver and play special teams at this point in his career. So I think the Corey Davis ship has sailed. Now watch the Jets will announce in, a, in an hour that they've re-signed him. But uh, I, I really would be very, very surprised if, if that happened. I think they'll go with Gibson as their third receiver and, and just try to rehabilitate Lazard. And key thing with Lazard, Sean Jefferson. Getting him as receivers coach, I think the Jets are really hopeful that Jefferson will be able to connect better with the receivers than Zach Azani did last year. I don't think Azani was the most popular guy in the receiver room. And yeah. I, think I think that offensive hoping... staff had a few guys. Uh, one of them still employed, and a couple of the other ones are not, that I don't think were the players were the biggest fans of, uh, I guess. <laughs> yeah. Well, the offensive line coach, Keith Carr, obviously, um, I don't think Sala wanted to pull the plug after a year. That's his guy, but Zach Azani, uh, bit the dust. And, you know, from what I understand, you know, a couple of players, maybe more than a couple had, had issues with him. So I think the jets are hoping that a better, a more player friendly coach, like a Sean Jefferson could kind of bring it out of Lazard. He's never going to be a star, but the guy did have, and since uh, Cleveland, yeah, he was what, 60, 80, game. he was 60, 80, and eight the year before, yeah, two years I mean, ago. He can get you 600 yards, you know, and 50 catches or something like that. So I, I don't think they're going to trash him just yet or, or throw him to the side, mostly because he probably would be by now if it wasn't for the $10 million guarantee. But so, but right now they, they got to try to work with him because they don't have a whole lot of wide receivers on the roster. Zach Wilson is a blank. Uh, this upcoming is he on an active roster? Connor Hughes came on two months ago and said Zach will not be on an active roster this year. And I posted it, and of course, everyone got very upset about it. I don't know that it's as crazy of a take now that it's aged a little bit. Where, like, where is he ending up? I've been in the spots that I thought, even at Kansas City, where it's like perfect, like just toss him behind Mahomes. You hope he never plays. Mahomes is never really hurt, and like all that stuff. Like, even that's gone. Like, I don't, I just, I simply don't know at well, this point. Yeah. Yeah, obviously he'll have to be a, for a three. I do think he'll be on a training camp roster. Yeah, now, I guys don't think an opening day. Oh, that could be a little. I mean, if he showed up in Kansas City, he he'd obviously have to try to win the third job there uh, behind Wentz. But uh, yeah, I don't know where. I think the Jets will ultimately trade him for probably the most embarrassing trade the NFL has ever seen. You know, they're going to have to eat. The salary, they're going to have to, you know, probably trade him for a seventh round pick in 2026, a conditional seven, and maybe attach something on it to get the team, maybe attach a six or a seven to it to get the team to pay a little bit more of the salary. Uh, I think the ultimate day three of the draft is the pressure point there. If he's still on the roster after day three, then it's like, you know, you know, they're going to have to cut him. He's not going to yeah. be on the team. And so I think it's conceivable that he could be out of football this year to start the year. I don't, yeah. I don't think he's locked in any, I mean, where would he be locked in? Like even some teams already have three quarterbacks. So it's, it's a rather, I'm fascinated by it. I know, I know it in the grand scheme of things, 
it's a small little thing because he's only a backup quarterback and most Jet fans have moved on already. But if, considering his draft pedigree and what happened to him over the last couple of years, to me, it's a fascinating little thing that they they can't get rid of this guy. And like, how much is it going to cost them to get rid of him? Yeah. Woody Johnson does not want to pay that salary. You know, so that, the Woody, I think he told everyone in the front office, you better get a trade for this guy because I don't want to pay these, the entire salary. So that's why the Jets are like exhausting. Joe Douglas is probably calling in every favor with any, every GM that he's had around the league just to try to get rid of this guy. It's, it's one of the funniest. It's not funny. And obviously it sucks for everybody involved. It's like a stain on the Jets. It's a stain on Zach Wilson, all these different things. But it is <laughs> – I, I remember we talked a year ago, I think on this podcast, and I said they should trade him to Arizona for a 2025-4 and it can, can move up to a two or something like that. And, like, looking back, like, wow, I was really uh, overshooting the moon there. <laughs> this is uh, – we're looking at, like, flop, flipping 256 for 255, and, like, it's 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 tough. Yeah. it's Even, uh... even without this, like, you mentioned it there, like, Carson once had to wait till like, middle of the year last year, and that's a guy who almost won an MVP and has been paid by one of the best organizations in football and then got traded for multiple – like, I, it's it's not just the salary. It's, like, there's – People don't want to admit it. There's some serious issues. Uh, you know, it's not just game. the salary. It's the, you know, it's the lack of production. And and much like the Wentz case, there's the perception. The locker room stuff, too. The locker room stuff. Like, Wentz got that reputation that he wasn't a good teammate. He wasn't a good locker room guy. I think the Colts learned that the hard way. And the same thing with Zach Wilson. Now, I do think he matured this year. But he's once you get that, it's like a stigma. It's hard to get rid of. It's a, like, I think you just used the word stain. What was a stain or, I mean, a stain on the jets, but it's a stain on him too, because of the two thing two years ago when he refused to take accountability. And then the story this year by the athletic by Diana that said, you know, he was reluctant to come back in, which I totally believe. And then at the end of the year, he didn't want to play, even though he could have, you know, he, he took the concussion to the end of the year. And so when he had his mother go on social media and basically announced that he was done for the year, which was not a good PR move. So those things are attached to him now. And it's unfortunate, but that's the reality he's living in. Yeah, it was. Uh, that's one of those. That's one of those days we'll talk about in 10 years of the fact that Zach Wilson went out with a wrist injury, then was dehydrated, then randomly had a concussion and was shut down for the season. Um, wild stuff. Um, not saying anything. I'm just saying it was a wild scenario. Rich, obviously, really appreciate your time. I know we were going to go 25 minutes there and went an not, not extra 20 minutes riffing, but oh, that's all right. I appreciate your time as always. Obviously, make sure everyone's tuned into your to your stuff coming out this weekend, and uh, you know, try to try to enjoy the next couple of weeks before uh, the draft and rookie mini camp, and uh, getting back to the drive in New Jersey. Yeah, I'll be out there probably next week for their pre-draft uh, press conference and. Uh... And away we go. <laughs> Thanks for having me, Will. I really appreciate it.